Secretary of Treasury. Deals with money. Hi, and welcome back to Mr. Raymond's Civics EOC Academy, where today we will be looking at federalism, the federal, state, and local governments working together. Now, last time we covered the rule of law as well as types of law and sources of law. So if you missed that or any of our other videos, go to our channel and check them out. Now, we see here that our benchmark explains we need to know the relationship and division of powers between the national and state governments, the lawmaking process at the various levels and how government obligations and services are different at the various levels all of which we will be covering today and just a reminder teachers that this PowerPoint lesson plans activities and worksheets are all available at teachers pick teachers just search for mr. Raymond civics EOC Academy so federalism describes how we live under three levels of government the national which we call the federal government as well as state governments and local governments and for your exam, you're going to need to know the different jobs for each of these levels of government. For instance, the national government deals with things like the military and fighting wars, making treaties or agreements with other countries, building and maintaining our interstate highway systems, protecting the environment, and large welfare programs like Social Security and Medicare. Now, a lot of the national responsibilities are shared with state governments, and there is a lot of crossover between the various levels of governments. For instance, states have their own environmental and welfare programs, but they also have responsibilities that they don't share with the national government. And some of these include providing marriage and driver's licenses, education, state roads, and public safety programs. So for the national or federal government, think of large programs that affect everyone in the country, like protecting us from other countries, providing disaster relief, delivering the mail, protecting us from terrorists, and providing our money system. States provide a lot of different licenses, again, like drivers and marriage licenses, but also businesses and working people. Like I have a teaching license or certificate from the state of Florida to teach there. This is also because education is done by the states. States also handle elections and make and enforce laws. State Governments are also in charge of creating local governments like counties and cities and towns and villages. This local level helps carry out state programs like recycling and trash pickup, libraries and parks, and set up local schools for the state by establishing school districts which hire your teachers and provide the buildings for your schools. Now you need to know a definition for federalism, which simply means that power is shared between the national and state governments. But as you can tell, there's much more to that as our definition leaves out the local level. The reason it's called federalism is because America has what is known as a federal system of government, also known as a federation. Federal systems work well for large countries like the United States because you have a national or central government that can organize big things like fighting wars, as well as state governments that are going to deal with issues that are a little closer to home. For instance, people living in Florida have a lot of different issues affecting them than, say, people in North Dakota. Now, one of the confusing parts of calling this system of sharing power between the national and state governments federalism is that we call our national government the federal government. So the word federalism kind of leaves out the state part. In fact, we have a lot of fed words, which you've had to learn this year, that mean very different things. We had the federalists and the anti-federalists, and they also gave us the federalist papers. We had the Articles of Confederation, a confederal government, and now we have federalism. The one thing you have in your favor when memorizing all of these words is that whenever we see a fed, you know we're talking about national powers. Now, speaking of powers, you are going to need to know the rules for how national government and state governments are going to share these powers. And whenever we want to know the rules for government, we have to turn to our trusty rule book for the government, the U.S. Constitution. And in this case, we're going to look at the Bill of Rights and the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which says that any powers not listed in the Constitution for the federal government are reserved for the states. 
that word reserved is going to be important because that's what we call state powers, reserved powers. The Constitution also clarifies who has more power with Article 6, which we call the Supremacy Clause. And remember, if something is supreme, it means it's at the top. So Article 6, the Supremacy Clause, clarifies that national laws and the U.S. Constitution are more powerful than state laws and state constitutions. In other words, state laws that go against federal laws or the U.S. Constitution are going to lose in our court system. Here's a little chart showing us the hierarchy. At the bottom are city or county laws, which are known as ordinances. Above that, we have state laws or statutes, then state constitutions, then national laws, which are called acts, and at the top is the U.S. Constitution. Now, in our next video, we are going to take a closer look at state constitutions with our focus on the Florida Constitution. And state constitutions are just like the U.S. They explain how the government is set up, what the goals are, how the three branches are set up, and what their jobs are. Unlike the U.S. Constitution, we see here that the Florida Constitution describes taxes, local governments, and education. So the Florida Constitution is a lot more specific about what the job of the state government is and what powers they have. So now we're going to look at some of the specific powers and compare them between the national government and state governments. And you're very likely to see a Venn diagram like the ones we're going to look at now. So you might want to write this down. The first slide shows you the title for the three types of powers that you need to know. National powers are referred to as either express powers or delegated powers. Express powers means that these are the powers that are listed in the Constitution, and this includes the enumerated powers of Congress that you learned about in one of our earlier videos. The next type of powers are concurrent powers. These are powers that are shared by the national government and state governments. And finally, we have reserved powers. And these are powers reserved to the states, as we saw clarified by the Tenth Amendment. And here are the powers you need to know for your exam. Are you writing these down? For national, we have regulate foreign and interstate commerce, coin money, provide an army and navy, declare war, establish federal courts below the U.S. Supreme Court, I would change conduct foreign relations to established treaties, and finally, implied powers, which you remember come from the Necessary and Proper Clause, also known as the Elastic Clause, which lets the national government stretch their powers, and we'll come back to this later in the video. Concurrent powers, both the national and state governments can tax, they can borrow money, they both provide for the general welfare, they both establish courts, and they can both pass and enforce laws. Finally, reserve powers are the state powers we see regulate intra-state commerce. Intra means within, so this is regulating trade within the state border. Establish local governments, administer elections, protect the public's health and welfare and morals. I'm not sure what they're talking about with morals. I would add education to this list and marriage. So that Venn diagram before mentioned establishing governments. So let's take a quick look at who is in charge of creating the various governments. As you know, the U.S. Constitution created the new federal government in 1787. Congress is in charge of creating new states. And finally, state governments create counties, cities, towns, and villages. Here we see there's one national government, 50 state governments, and almost 90,000 local governments in the United States. Now here's a look at how the three branches are made up at the three levels. For the legislative, we have the U.S. Congress at the federal level. Below that, each state has their own legislative bodies, usually just called state legislatures. And the lawmaking body at the local level would be the city or town council. For the executive branch, the president heads up the national executive, the governor is in charge of the state executive branch, and the mayor is the executive for cities and towns and sometimes counties. Judicial, we have the U.S. Supreme Court at the 
federal level, state Supreme Courts like the Florida Supreme Court are the head of the judicial branch at the state level, and local courts, usually called county courts, which are part of state court systems, are found at the local level. Okay, so our benchmark said we need to know the lawmaking process at all three levels, so here we go. We spent an entire video looking at how laws are made at the national level, so if you haven't checked that out, go to our channel. National laws are called acts, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended segregation, or the Affordable Health Care Act, which you might have heard your parents talking about. It's known as Obamacare. These are congressional acts or laws aimed at all Americans. Now, states pass a lot of laws, and here we see the word that you learned before, statutes, which just means laws passed by legislatures. The state legislatures pass most of the laws dealing with everything from murder to speed limits, as the state and local police are responsible for enforcing state laws that really guide our everyday actions. State lawmakers also pass amendments and regulations, so your state legislature is very busy, especially compared to the U.S. Congress. Local governments also pass laws, and these local laws, again, are called ordinances. Local ordinances can cover a wide variety of issues. For instance, the village I live in has ordinances on how loud our music can be after certain hours. And one of my favorites, they have a curfew for kids under 18. So kids have to be home by a certain hour. And it's one of my favorites because my students always freak out when I bring it up. As you already know, the U.S. Congress is a two-house legislature, which means bicameral, and it's made up of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Now, almost all of the states have a two-house legislature as well. Only Nebraska doesn't. And the vast majority, like Florida, use the same names as the U.S. Congress. They have a House of Representatives and a Senate. Now, there's a huge variety of local lawmaking bodies and how they are set up. But most towns and cities have a council of elected officials, of which the mayor is usually a part, that pass laws or ordinances for the city. Just a quick view of the executive branch again. The federal executive branch is headed up by the president with the vice president and his cabinet. At the state level, the executive branch, which is in charge of enforcing state laws, is headed by the governor, and the second in charge is known as the lieutenant governor. The governor has a cabinet, but unlike the president, they are elected. At least in Florida, they are. Governors have various state agencies overseeing everything from the environment, the economy, and education to the elderly, prisons, and tourism. At the local level, the executive is the mayor, and they handle local agencies like the parks department, trash pickup, and local schools. In a previous video, we looked at the various levels of courts, and these are the same for national courts as they are for state courts. Here is a chart of Florida's court system, and we see local courts at the bottom known as county courts or circuit courts. In the middle, we have the state State Court of Appeals, which is called the District Court of Appeals, and the State Supreme Court at the top. Okay, so we're almost done, I swear. Now, sometimes people refer to two different types of federalism, either marble cake federalism or layer cake federalism. Layer cake implies that all three levels are doing their own thing without much interaction or mixing together of the various levels. Whereas marble cake federalism is kind of what America has today, with all three levels levels mixing together and working together on various programs. So which level is the most powerful and which level has the greatest impact on your life? The interaction of these levels and who does what has always been a topic of debate in America. Remember back to the beginning of the year when we discussed the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Anti-Federalists like Thomas Jefferson wanted a tiny national or central government and most of the governing to be done on the state level. Whereas Federalists like Alexander Hamilton thought that only a strong national government with a lot of resources could help guide and create a strong country. This debate continues today as Democrats call for strong national government programs to help out the people and the states, and Republicans call for shrinking the federal government and letting states handle most of the issues. The size and scope of the federal government has increased dramatically over the years, with about 150 federal employees in 1800 
hundred and four million federal employees today. For a long time, the national government left the states to operate pretty independently, but we saw increases such as during the Civil War and the Progressive Era of the early 1900s. But it was far and away the Great Depression and Franklin D. Roosevelt's rapid expansion of national programs that greatly increased the reach and size of the federal government. Later, the federal government used the Elastic Clause and the Commerce Clause to stop states from segregating their citizens and to push federal programs such as Obamacare. Politicians continued to debate the relationship between the national and state governments and the ever-changing face of federalism. And that's where we will end up. We'll look at state constitutions and local governments coming up, but before we do, let's review. What do you call a system in which power is shared between the national and state governments? I hope you got that. It's the name of this presentation. It's federalism. What are the three levels of government? Again, pretty easy. It is national, which is the federal government, state, and local. What do you call powers that are shared between the federal and state governments? That was the middle of our Venn diagram. Those are called concurrent powers. What do you call powers that are left for the states? Remember, if it's not listed in the Constitution, they are reserved for the states. Which amendment reserved powers to the states? That would be the 10th Amendment, the last amendment of the Bill of Rights. Name one concurrent power. Well, there's a few. That's the power to tax is shared by both, create courts, make and enforce laws, borrow money, and provide for the general welfare. Of course, there's more, but those are the big ones you need. Which level provides licenses and education? Remember, I work for the state of... Florida. Which level provides garbage collection and schools? That would be like the school buildings and the teachers. That's the local level. Which level prints money and makes treaties? That's the big one. That's the federal or national. What is the executive called on the state level? It's not the president, it's the governor. What is the executive called on the local level? That's the mayor. What event and program is known for greatly increasing the size of the federal government? That would be the Great Depression and FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal program. Okay, and that's it. I want to thank you guys for watching. Up next, we're going to be looking at state constitutions, and then we're going to go over local governments, and then we're almost done. Be sure to subscribe so you can catch those videos. Just a reminder, teachers, that this PowerPoint lesson plans, worksheets, etc., is available at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just search for Mr. Raymond's Civic CEOC Academy. And thanks for watching.